This is the heartbeat of human services, a peek into the inspiring stories of our community and all things DHS. Join us. Hi there, everybody. It's 2023, and we are back. This is Janice Slagle, and I am the host of the Heartbeat of Human Services. And welcome. Today we have Angela, Dr. Angela Look with us. Hi, Angela. Good morning. So glad to have you with us. And you just got finished doing a presentation at the Kern County Network for Children Collaborative on the topic of... Human trafficking. Human trafficking. And so January has been a full month, hasn't it? I mean, you guys, <laughs> you guys have really increased your awareness campaign and done so much more this month. Yes, I think now that we have the task force as well as KCAT, we had kind of the combination thereof of both events. So it's been a very full and, and good month. Yes, I love it. I think I'm learning as I um, help with this topic, I'm learning so much more too. Um, and what is the difference between the Kern Coalition Against Human Trafficking and the task force? What? So the task force was um, kind of initiated by our district attorney's office, and it's much more related to law enforcement and prosecution. So um, other than myself, normally the task force itself is, pro is, is detectives and uh, federal jurisdiction as well as every other local jurisdiction and the, the prosecution from district attorney's office. So it's much more related to the, the investigation and prosecution. Um, and then on, on the current coalition against human trafficking, it's a community wide, uh, like a grassroots organization that, that we all come together to, to see how we can all help work together. So, you know, yes, we need detectives, we need prosecutors, but we also need employers who can give jobs to our, our youth who are trying to exit the life. We also need families who can step in and take placement of youth, you know, that need a home if they're in foster care. Like we all have a part to play in that. And that's really where KCAT comes in because it's community wide. That's great. And KCAT has been around for a little while, right? Since 2012. Like to 2012. Mm -hmm. Okay. I remember Phil Grazley was yeah, it? Yeah, he started it. He was really good communicator. Um, and now it, the leadership has changed, which they're great too. Dustin. It's changed a few right? times. Yeah. So yeah. Dustin Contreras and Carol B. Croft from the Women's Center High Desert uh, out in Ridgecrest are the co-directors. Are the current co-directors. They're doing a great job too. And you, your role is, you've been doing a lot of speaking this month, haven't you? Yes. Every January gets a little interesting, but I love to, to do that whenever I can out in the community and just increase awareness. So mm -hmm. as the supervisor at Child Protective Services, of course, my role is, is specific. Um, but when I can increase that awareness so that we can prevent some of the, the victims from ever becoming victims. Becoming victims, yeah. That's what we want to see happen. Right. And so the more education we do, the more people learn about the topic. And it isn't like when I first heard about the topic through um, Canyon Hills Church, because we do a lot of, um, I go there too, a lot of fundraising. But when I first heard about it, my only experience was the movie Taken, which we know now is so <laughs> not, not the way. we see in America. <laughs> but it kind of started that way. Maybe for many of us, that's kind of what we thought that it was. And of course, that was over glamour and everything like that and very dramatic but then um, I started learning more about it and so I would love to hear from you some of the um, just what do you think makes someone vulnerable to becoming a victim of trafficking so that's a really hard question because there's so many different things and mm -hmm. and what everybody needs to recognize is anybody could be a victim especially with technology because it can be as easy and I've seen it more times than I can count a teenage girl puts a picture on social media, whichever one she's on, where there's perpetrators at the same time, a guy says, you're beautiful. They start talking to one another. She starts to get these little feelings in her little heart, right? Mm -hmm. And he, then she, she agrees to meet up with him. She thinks he cares about her. She loves him. And then when he asks her to do something that because he needs help, Right. That's what happens. That's what happens. It can happen just that easily. But we know statistically, of course, kids who are in, in foster care are mm -hmm. extremely vulnerable. So studies range from 68 to 86 percent of kids who have been victims had previous social workers in their lives. So and I when I was at something that you guys were doing the other day, the ages were like eight to 60 or something like that. They, somebody had just uncovered something and that there was, was a, a recent labor trafficking situation okay, labor in trafficking. our in our town and the the ages of the victims ranged from eight to I think 66 which was really surprising I guess not as much in the labor field that that makes more sense maybe actually but. in the in the sex exploitation mm -hmm. piece that is not uncommon either that 
that varying range of age. Yes, because the grooming can start really young. And we absolutely know that a child who has past sexual abuse history Mm -hmm. is four times more likely to be exploited or trafficked. So unfortunately, it can be a really easy transition for a kid who's already been victimized in that way Mm -hmm. or victimized with sexual abuse to become a victim in this way Because it's not as crazy of a thing to think about when you've been Literally, you'll hear a pimp say, well, your uncle already took it for free. You may as well make money crazy, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So when I'm hearing you talk about, you know, how they speak to young men or women, like you're so pretty. Mm-hmm. And so there is the vulnerability of the need in yes. the first place, right? So yes. I would imagine then, you know, children, like you said, in foster care, they, they don't have maybe someone telling them, you know, how important they are, how mm-hmm. special they are. Absolutely. So, so just parents making sure that they're Making sure they know their kids are valued, right? That would be a huge thing. Yeah, just that basic insecurity is Mm -hmm. a huge vulnerability. And let's be honest, when you think that the the target age is really like junior high age, Mm -hmm. how many of us were not insecure in junior high, right? So I think back, I was extremely insecure um, and had some smooth talking man come along Mm -hmm. at my, in those ages for me, I might would have gone with him because they don't realize what's going to happen. Right. right? Kids There's... don't have that ability to like think right. forward. Um, and it just seems so great at the mm. moment. And they just want that so much. Right. right. And yet. Wow. What ends up happening is tragic. Very tragic. And so, um, you know, I'm, I don't know if there's programs to protect our kids online, but they're so savvy, they know how to get around them. So, you know, I guess just having these conversations with our children and hoping that they're listening to these kinds of traps that are set for them, right? Yes, absolutely. I know I, I heard a survivor say once, and I've said it since, um, you know, for parents, just being present in your kids' lives is mm-hmm. so important. Um, but I'm also, as a parent of nine children myself, mm-hmm. I am not a big fan of privacy for kids. Like parents who won't look at their kids' phones because it's their phone. Like I'm not okay with that personally. And mm-hmm. I would absolutely recommend, especially if you have a younger kid that has a phone, which I don't agree with either. Um, look at that phone. Look at the apps that they're on. Sometimes apps seem really like, oh, that's an innocuous little thing. Guess what? It's not. The mm-hmm. monkey app, that's to set up dates. Wow. That's to buy sex. Okay, I'm not even aware of monkey. Yeah, app. there's okay. there and and honestly, apps come up every day, like new apps. And so if you don't know what those apps are, and your kids might have it on their phone, and you think it's fine, and you may not even realize in the next room your kid is setting up a date with a 40 year old man. Wow. So wh- <laughs> that monkey one is. Are there others that you know of that? Oh, I mean, gosh. there's so many. Uh, there's know, so many, and I'm trying to. We just this, learned of the, a new one from a, one of our referrals the other day that none of my workers had heard of either. Um, but I mean, oh, Tinder, yeah. I mean, there's all kinds yeah. of them, unfortunately. So check that out. I know for right. all of my kids who do have phones, we we approve any app that goes onto their phone. We have oh, parental good. controls where even my son, who's now 18, he's like, I'm 18. I don't care. Um, <laughs> you're in my house still, so I'm still going to have it. Yeah. Um, we have to approve any app that they put on their phone. So I would absolutely encourage parents to think about things like that. Mm-hmm. There's other apps like bark that you can see pretty much if there's any sexual content on your kids phones and things like that there's a lot parents can do Mm -hmm. it takes time and it takes investment and and the the knowledge that of what's out there um but it is so important to protect our kids because you know we have the average age of viewing pornography for the first time pre-covid was 11. I absolutely think it went down during covid COVID. so once they've started to to Mm go across those lines. Mm -hmm. It's so easy for that grooming process and and for those perpetrators to come in the picture. So look at your 11 year old kid and recognize what could actually be happening. So the entrance of pornography opens them up to even being more vulnerable, right? Absolutely. Okay. That's a good thing for parents to know. I think sometimes we think pornography and, you know, people think it's very innocuous, but it isn't. Research is very clear at this point that Uh, First of all, many people who are engaged in the pornography are not there by choice, so they can Mm. be victims of exploitation and trafficking right there. But research is very clear that there's a a link between viewing pornography early on, getting an addiction to pornography, and then later buying sex, and so they become the perpetrators of buying the sex. Because they probably get worn down with their emotions, and it doesn't seem like a wrong thing anymore, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Wow. So eye opening. So many things we can do as parents. Um, I think it's just really important. The other thing I wanted to ask you is, well, and you kind of touched on a little bit, but how do traffickers find their victims? 
again, there's a lot of a lot of places, unfortunately. <laughs> online but a online is a is a huge one. Yeah, because you media. don't know how old the person you're talking to Absolutely. is, right? And there are 750,000 predators online at any moment. Wow. Like as a parent and as a professional who's given my life to help kids, that's a that's a that's scary huge. statistic, right? And we should think about that. Mm-hmm. Um, one way that our our kids especially our boys become really vulnerable nowadays is video games. Mm. So most of these video games they play online and they're right. chatting to people and, and parents have no recognition of who is talking to your kid and, and who is hearing everything that's going on in your house. Wow, because the thing is, scary. especially when they wear those headphones, right? My right. sons have them. Um, if, if somebody's on the other line, on the other end of that headphone, they can hear if the parents are gone. They can hear if there's conflict in the house. They can hear if they're siblings. And all of those pieces of information can then be used against that kid. So let's say the child meets up with this person and they don't want to have sex with this adult. Well, you do it or I'm going to go get your little brother or your little sister. Because they know there's a little they know. from listening. Wow. All that's... of that information. So you have now allowed this a- the stranger mm-hmm. into your home without even knowing it. And all of that information comes back. Those, it's, unfortunately, our perpetrators are very intelligent mm-hmm. and they know how to individualize their targeting practices. And we have to get smarter because otherwise our kids just. Yeah, that know. one is a little tricky, man. That one, the gaming really, that's a scary one. <laughs> so sadly, that is something that hit home in my own home. Mm-hmm. And this is how why I'm like, oh, my gosh, when my my oldest biological son, who's now 18, crazy. Um, <laughs> he was 12 and I was just kind of getting into this world. And of course, video games are not my world. Um, I happened to see the phone that was at the house for the kids. We had like an extra phone at the house. I saw these like messages. And again, I don't play video games, so I had no clue. And so I asked my husband and he's like, oh, that's from the video games. Like people can send you messages. I'm like, uh, he's like, I just go through and delete them. And I'm like, well, you haven't done that in a while. But I looked and I happened to click on one of those. I feel like it was Providence, right? Mm -hmm. I click on one of those messages. And even though my kids who have been raised with mom who works at CPS, mom who talks to them, mom who tries to educate them, if you would have asked me, I would say my kids would never respond to a stranger. I've taught them. Right. Um, Random stranger asked my son, first thing, how old are you? Wow. There was no even an introduction of like, hey, like good video gaming or any, like how old are you? And my kid with crazy mom that I am, I'm 12. Oh, no. I almost hurt my kid at that moment, but I did not. Um, But I was just, it was like the surreal moment of recognition that if my son, who's been taught from me, if he would answer Mm. a stranger, what would the other kids do that don't have that? Right. And what would have happened had I not seen that message? Ugh. It's, it's a terrifying right. thought. So I can see, I, I've you seen it see firsthand. They, can how, you block okay. messaging on those apps? I that mean, is a those, question I would have to ask my husband. I wonder if there's a way to. I'm not sure. I th- see, that's so, something we should look at. And I'm looking over here at Allison, <laughs> who's a gaming person so, herself. So me not knowing that, what we did instead, like I sat all of my kids down, mm-hmm. especially my boys. I have six boys. So, you know, the rule in our house is you do not play a video game with anybody who you have not met in real life. That's because it's like, well, they're friends of this. No, 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 no. Do you know? Do they go to school with you? Do you have you seen their face? And so and my kids will snitch on on each other. if they. (laughs) He's playing with somebody he doesn't know. It's it's just been made a hard and fast rule in my home. And they know why. Yeah. I've explained all of that to them. Of course, my kids hear a lot more than probably most people's age appropriately. Right. Um, But figure out ways to try and help keep your kids safe. And if there are safeguards like that, that's great. Yeah. Like if you can block it. And I know that probably some people enjoy the interaction, which I get, but if they're kids, we should be blocking probably. So we'll, we'll find out more about that. (laughs) So that's a little bit of a safeguard there. Um, so really it can almost make you paranoid, but it's a good kind of thing, you know, to just, (laughs) especially in your world. But it's like looking at all of these things as there's sharks out there and I'm this little fish, right? You really have to be aware. Absolutely. And things like going to the mall yeah like unfortunately the malls are very well known places for teenage girls and boys to be with little to no parental supervision Mm -hmm. and pimps are there dang they you know establish that initial like i said Mm -hmm. you're so pretty you could be a model come with me i know somebody and she goes because in her 13 year old brain he really thinks I'm beautiful and thinks I can be a model, not he's going to go traffic me. Right. And what right? girl doesn't want to hear that at 13? Exactly. Or most any age exactly. women want to hear that. Yeah, that's so. But we do see young men being chosen Absolutely. for the same similar situations. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Which and, is 
you know, one of the vulnerabilities is that need for attention, that need for love, right? Yeah. And and we've seen so many times, both boys and girls, it's being in relationships with these older men and they end up exploiting them and using them mm. and sometimes trafficking them. Dang. And then their life is very, very, it's, it's hard to come back from that. I mean, there's a lot being done, which yes. is wonderful. And I know that there's hope, um, but better to on the prevention side absolutely ab- so that we it's don't very see these hard to get them happen. out once they're in it yeah and um you know you guys use this term and i've been to many of your trainings and our department's trainings the life they, we call it the life once mm-hmm. they get into this what would you say is one of the biggest myths about people who get caught up in the life that they want to be there like or that they're choosing it that they're choosing it i mean let's be honest most of us who have been at least in bakersfield very long you've driven down union yeah you've seen it and yet somehow we have enabled ourselves to turn a blind eye to it. How have we become so immune mm. to it? And I think it's we've like somehow rationalized it in our head that he or she is choosing to be out there, right? Like, oh, right. she That's wouldn't be true. there, she don't want to be. Yeah. We we go past it every day. And, and yeah. but I think that's one reason, one way we've been able to do that. Definitely a myth is that boys aren't victims, which they absolutely are, absolutely can be. We really need to be better about recognizing that. Um. I'm your co-host, Allison, and I'm interrupting today's podcast to highlight positions available at Kern DHS. We highly recommend applying if you're looking for a position that can help launch your county career. The following positions are available. Extra help, technical support specialist two. If you're interested in our human services technician position, head to our Facebook to check out our newly launched video that will provide you with valuable information about the position. Apply online today at kerncounty.com under the careers tab. We're also excited about the launch of the JobFest website. If you or someone you know is looking for a job, or if you're an employer, head to jobfestkern.com. Thank you for listening, and now back to the podcast. Those are the two I thought of. Gosh, right well, those are big. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's true because, I mean, even I think we probably do the same with the homeless population. Absolutely. We think they're choosing it and not always. They are not always. Absolutely. But um, I think the reason maybe we think that way, or at least for me, it's because I don't really know what to do. Like yeah. when I see someone and I think, oh, that's so sad. What to, can I do? Yeah. So when you see someone that's, you know, you, you do see scantily clothed, clothed young women walking down yes. Union. What what should we do when we see that? Well, is there anything? We and can? the problem is, it's a really hard answer. Yeah, because you know you can't you can't go rescue them usually. Right. And of course, you don't want to put yourself in danger. Sure. So for anybody listening, like don't don't do that. <laughs> run out there and try to like think you're going to save everybody because that puts yourself in danger too. Because of mm-hmm. course, they're money they're to somebody. You. They're right. money, and you're going to impede with that, and you're going to be in trouble yourself, right? Right. Um, Definitely. If you see something that can be reported, then do that. Mm-hmm. We are so thankful both to have our unit, um, but also law enforcement around us is is getting much better and have specialized detectives and people that are trained in this. So when you call something in to law enforcement or to CPS, if it's child related, you have people who are much more aware, recognize the signs, are better at interacting with those situations, asking questions in a different manner. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you see something, report it. Don't just turn a blind eye and think uh, you may not be able to intervene at that moment, but maybe somebody else can. Yeah. And so when you say report it, do you suggest calling not the not 911 or just the regular law enforcement If it's like line? an immediate like emergency, an emergency, if you see a pimp beating a girl down, call yeah, 911. Course. But, but if, if you, you see something else, just call the regular yeah, the number. Regular law enforcement. Um, because, of course, you know, when we start to see trends or, or certain motels that are being used or a certain place that this is happening, law enforcement can set different things up and, mm-hmm. and look into things, right? right they have right. some really great tools and some really great brains working on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then over here, of course, if you call 631-6011, mm-hmm. our hotline, I always put it's it out there, right? Yeah, right. Um, and state anything about concern that this kid might be exploited or trafficked, that's going to come automatically to our unit, which is going to have specialized staff who just they are fantastic. My staff are fantastic with how they talk to a kid, how they can, mm. you know, speak the language that they speak right. and really get, you know, to the heart of the matter, as well as link them to some services mm-hmm. to try and help, at least when they're ready for that help. Yeah. And so just 631-6011 is the Child Protective Services hotline, yes. right? And so if you think a child is a victim of anything of yes. this nature. So then you touched on something, Angela, with, um, you know, how your staff talk to people. And that's one thing I've learned is that many times people in these situations don't see themselves as victims. Isn't that yes. right? Absolutely. And that's, you know, there's something we talk about in our unit a lot called stages of change. 
And if somebody is not in the place where they recognize that they're a victim, we can talk mm-hmm. and talk and talk and throw services and help and this and that. And they're probably not going to accept it because they're not at a place where they can or that they're ready. Um, and so sadly, we we watch girls and boys and adults go back. Mm-hmm. And it's heartbreaking. I think mm-hmm. that's one of the hardest parts of our job because we can't hog tie them and keep right. them, right? We can't yeah. keep them safe. Yeah. We wish we could. Um, but that's not the reality. And so we let them know that there are safe people. We let them know that there are, are services out there. And the prayer and hope is when they are ready, then they they remember that information and they come back. And we often see the same kids multiple times. So that it takes consistency time and mm-hmm. that relationship and that trust can be built. And that's exactly why my unit is designed the way it is. That's so good. So do you think that the reason they don't see themselves as victim is in part just survival? Like just to feel like, okay, I'm choosing this and mm-hmm. I'm in charge of my life kind of thing. Well, I think it can depend on the situation. Sometimes they want to believe he loves them and he's just their boyfriend, right? And mm-hmm. I'm just helping him out. And he wouldn't do that because he loves me. Very mm-hmm. similar to a domestic violence situation. Right. And the trauma bond that happens with your abuser and domestic violence is very similar, um, oftentimes with with trafficking victims. Yes, there's definitely the, the piece of a kid um, who's lost all control in their life anyways. And they've been a you know a sexual abuse victim since they were six and, and this. And now they want to think they want to think mm-hmm. that they have control here, right? And so definitely there's that piece of it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's many facets. The and of course, bond, there, yeah. yeah, the trauma bond and even just the psychological trauma. And and if you talk to the survivors that we have on, that we contract with, it's it's a really hard realization to accept that you've I been bet. a victim. Yeah. And that often I takes bet that's time. that's really hard. Yeah. yeah. And I, I can imagine because you feel, you probably feel a lot of shame and embarrassment and, oh my gosh, what did I yeah, do? Absolutely. But the, one of the sad things too is that oftentimes maybe they're lured that they're going to be paid for things and they mm-hmm. aren't, right? Like the, the Most traffickers keep the Most oftentimes they're not. Most yeah. oftentimes the trafficker keeps all the money. Mm-hmm. In, in labor and sex trafficking, both, they might be promised all kinds of things and, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And they get very little of that, if any. Um, and so that, that again, is, is the definition, right? That this person is benefiting from their work, if it's sexual work or any other kind of work, and wow. that's how they're being trafficked. So the only thing that they're getting out of it is thinking that someone loves them and that they're, yeah. Oftentimes. That's crazy. Yeah. So um, what would you... What, what can we do? Like, I think you talked a little bit about what, what can we do if we suspect someone is stuck in the life that you should report it, that law enforcement has ways of talking to them and your staff also. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything else? Because this happens to adults and children and mm-hmm. our, our as the Department of Human Services, we're looking at children and yes. law enforcement helps the adult, I Absolutely. would say. Right. Absolutely. Is there anything else that we, we could talk about what we can do? Well, like I always talk about, you know, being being a positive person, especially mm-hmm. if it's a child and you suspect it, like be, be that positive person, be it, mm. be someone who's modeling what healthy relationships look like. Like you can show for them what can be mm-hmm. right. Maybe they've never seen mm-hmm. that. Maybe they've never had that model for them. You might be the first one. And as a social worker here at the department, I say that all the time, you might be the one healthy adult in their life. Don't, oh. don't minimize that. Yeah. And you might not see it pay off right away, but realize you're planting those seeds. You know, I had mm-hmm. a, a male survivor who said that at a recent training, like social workers, especially they're, they're planting seeds. Mm. They don't always see the, the payoff, but he actually became tearful as he was talking about it. Wow. And, and I think we need to remember that even as a social worker or anyone who is planting those seeds mm-hmm. into to children, even if they're in a bad situation, you never know what seeds you might be planting if you are willing Mm-hmm. because they're not always easy kids. Yeah. <laughs> they're not always easy adults just because of their trauma. Right. Um, but being willing to stay with them, to be consistent, to, mm-hmm. to be a positive person, you never know how that might impact. So, and when we plant positive seeds like that, then people are drawn to that, right? Mm-hmm. So hopefully they'd be drawn to the healthier relationships Absolutely. rather than these kind of trafficking situation. That's yeah. Good. That's well, good. because a, a survivor that I heard speak one time said the the outcome of being a trafficking victim is you end up with this mantra going on in your head that I'm not good enough, Mm -hmm. like constantly. Um, And so you have to have a lot of positive to overcome that, right? And that's going to take a lot of time. That's good. That's really good. Is there, um, so today we're, we're recording this today is the 19th, I think. And you guys have, (laughs) is that right? The 19th? Yeah. So I know tonight, I I guess we're going to probably air this next week, but um, so 
the there is a 5k coming up i think it's on the 28th i want to yes. say is that right yes there's a 5k at riverwalk at on riverwalk. the 28th okay um and so the funds go to kcat or no the funds are actually going to the family justice center okay so that is a place um we again we're very blessed in kern county to have a family justice center because mm-hmm. not everybody does right um wherein they are there are advocates there are resources there for both children and adult alike and so that is something that the task force has partnered with the Family Justice okay. Center. Okay. And the Family Justice Center is is the Open Door Network part of that, or yes, how, how they does... have they have people there. Okay. So the Family Justice Center is a is supposed to be set up as like a one stop shop. Okay. For anything that a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, um, human trafficking would need, both law enforcement, legal help, you know, financial help from like. Um, the, the Department of Human Services, like downstairs, if, mm-hmm. if they, they need to get help, but also advocacy and support. And so that can all be accessed through the Family Justice Center over off on of, Oak, right? Yeah. Okay. And I did do so, I think we have a lot of this linked on our website. So our website is kcdhs.org. And if you scroll down, you can look for Human Trafficking Month, which is January. And we have all of the calendar of events that you guys are doing on there. So I think that's probably one stop easy place. But I love that you, the partnership for KCAT seems to be enlarging. It seems to be like you're you're connecting more with people and I keep hearing of more events. Um, I know Canyon Hills is having an event in March called the Red and White Gala and that is yes. designed to raise money for KCAT. So if people want to find out about that, we'll have that on our website also. Um, I'm hoping to go and dress up for the Yeah, that'll time. be fun. <laughs> I love that this community is just so, this is such an important topic and I see the community stepping up. So yes, I... You know, I feel so fortunate to be in Kern County on this topic, both because of the collaboration we as professionals have been able to to include. We have lived experience experts that we contract with who are able to work with our youth. Very few counties have that. And then, yes, our community as a whole mm-hmm. um, has definitely responded and stepped up and and are really trying to, great. to garner their awareness and how they can better help. Yeah, and I've seen a change also in law enforcement and how they look at this whole topic. Because again, when I first became aware of this topic, I felt like the, the we we looked down on the people who were prostituting themselves or whatever the proper term yeah. is. But now it's really like okay, they're victims too, Absolutely. and I think that's hugely changed. Yes. At least, don't you think? Absolutely. And we're looking at the people purchasing this as the ones who truly could are the problem. <laughs> well, I guess the part purchasers, of the, biggest... the buyers are for sure, but we definitely yeah. have a district attorney right now who's been gung-ho to get after the the, the pimps, the traffickers, the traffickers, whatever term you yeah. want to use. Um, and we've That's had several great. very successful um, cases prosecuted this year, several including minors. That's wonderful. I know the latest was um, got 28 years in prison for what the trafficking, right? Let me just put a plug out there. So we definitely need everybody's support um, for some more legislation change because the problem right now is human trafficking is not considered a serious and violent felony. So it is not a strike. It does not hold the same um, need to be in an to serve their sentence as right. long as a serious and violent Which cra- violent it's felony. It's crazy. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. Uh, I was fortunate to go to the Capitol last year when we tried. Shannon Grove took mm-hmm. um, what was then uh, SB 1042. It was not voted up. It was not right. uh, maintained. Don't yeah. get me started on the senators that were there. Um, <laughs> but she is taking it forward again. SB yes. 14. SB 14. Um, so we, if people want to show support, what yes, can they do? Please, please, please go in there. Um, I think... I think I that it's Shannon on her Grove website. has it on hers. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if any of our other ones do, but SB 14, we plan to take it back. We're not sure yet when that will go in front of the committee, um, but we are trying to get legislation changed so that human trafficking, which is absolutely violent and absolutely. serious, is considered a serious and violent felony. And then they will have to actually serve most of their sentence versus being able to get out much Good. sooner. Well, we so we fully support that. So absolutely. everybody out there, look at look at Shannon Grove's website. Absolutely. Um, and we can link that on ours too, kcdhs.org, Please. so that you can support that SB 14. Yes. That's huge. Yes. So anything else, Angela, as we um, end this podcast that you would like to leave our listeners with? regarding human trafficking and the work that's being done, which we're so proud of you. Really appreciate all that you're doing. We have a fantastic team here in Kern County, I must say. The collaboration is not like you see in almost any other place, and I'm very thankful. Um, I just I just want people to recognize it looks different than what you think. 
And if you expect it to look like taken, or if you expect it to look one certain way, you're going to miss it most mm-hmm. of the time. So please just increase kind of your awareness. There's tons of resources. I'm absolutely available if people want to know what else they can read or look at. Um, the World Without Exploitation is a fantastic uh, website. They have tons of webinars you can watch and, and just educate yourself. Um, World Without Exploitation. World Without okay. Exploitation. Um, there are many survivor written books out there that are fantastic. Renting Lacey is the favorite one of mine. It's a it's a hard read because mm-hmm. it's pretty graphic, but it, it's real. Mm-hmm. Um, we had that survivor here last year who the book is based upon. Um, just realize it's happening in our backyard. Yeah, like, this is real. Unfortunately, I know it all too well, but we all need to know that we do so that we all can best help. Um, and my other big push is we have to reduce demand. Yes. And that comes in many ways, including teaching our children what sex should be, what relationship should be. We value one another. Um, it's not always easy conversations. Believe me, I've had it with my children. Uh, <laughs> but so important, especially for our young boys. Absolutely. Talking about healthy relationships. Yes. So we will link the books that you mentioned, Angela, and the websites. Also, the Polaris Project is where I learned mm-hmm. kind of a lot, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. A lot of statistics. Yeah. A lot of good stuff. So we'll link all that on our website. But thank you so much for um, just making us more aware, Angela, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being our guest. Of course. Welcome back to our Mindful Minute I'm your co-host Paola Hernandez, and today we'll be tackling the topic of relationships and just how important they are to preserve your mental health. In our heavy chat about human trafficking, unfortunately the trafficking persons end up mixed up in bad company that manipulates them into thinking the worst about themselves and others, making them feel isolated. But in the same way that people can bring you down, they can also bring you up. Research shows that people with high levels of social support seem to be more resilient in the face of stressful situations. Social support can also provide you with comfort even when the stress feels completely unbearable. So always make sure to keep yourself in good company. On rough days, those positive attitudes and pep talks can make a stressful day a little less harsh. This has been your Mindful Minute. Thank you for joining us for the Heartbeat of Human Services podcast today. We hope you'll join us next time.